Hello, team. This is Chaplain Newland, your never daunted Koa Shepherd, with your dose of spiritual resilience for today. It is Sunday, April 5th. We are still at HPCon Charlie, and this is episode four of this virtual ministry response to the COVID 19 novel coronavirus. Remember, social distancing is real, but spiritual distancing is not authorized. Hey, just a quick note this morning, friends, to uh, introduce a video that I'm going to paste at the end of this intro. This is Holy Week, and I'm going to be doing a kind of a sermon on each day of significant importance. So these videos are going to be a little bit more sermony than my last few and a little bit longer. I'll mark them clearly in the feed so that if you're looking specifically for never daunted spiritual fitness moments, you can tell what you're looking at. This video that is about to follow is going to go to multiple places. It'll be posted here for Spiritual Fitness Minutes. Uh, it's going to go to my Fort Jerusalem Chapel feed, and it's also going to probably end up in front of some civilian church friends. So you're going to get kind of a double introduction as I get started here. Oh, and I'll be wearing my church clothes and not my army clothes. So fair warning to those of you who only ever see me in the office and not on Sundays. Enjoy, and a blessed Holy Week to you and yours, wherever you may be. Christians around the world mark this Sunday with a story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey. We call it Palm Sunday, after the palm branches that are waved while Jesus parades into the city. Or we call it Passion Sunday, for the events that quickly follow of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Either way, today is the entry into Holy Week the most sacred space in the Christian calendar and the pivot point of the history of salvation. Let's begin by hearing the scriptures. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew at chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The events of Holy Week speak for themselves, and I think we are often best served simply by hearing these texts and falling into contemplation before them. I do want to offer two quick comments, however, to aid in our contemplation. The first is to provide just a touch of historical context. The second is to say that what happens next, because it will matter in the week that is to come. First, remember that this story takes place during a time when Jerusalem is occupied territory. The Roman Empire is very concerned that as the holy days of the Passover feast approach, their Jewish subjects aren't allowed to incite political revolt or riot. Remember, too, that the Roman Empire has an important tradition of triumphal processions. When a victorious general returned to Rome, he rode a mighty stallion, and his troops marched behind him, and the spoils of war, treasures, goods, and slaves were carried in the procession. This triumphal parade is part of the national and religious language of the Roman Empire. By the first century, only Caesar gets to have a triumph. And so when Jesus enters Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, a beast of burden and work, rather than a beast of battle and might like the war horse, 
and leads not an army of soldiers, but a ragged band of followers and disciples, he is making a statement, a statement that we might miss, but that those waving their branches of palm and cheering this prophet from Nazareth could not have missed. To name Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in this manner is to say not only that that is what Jesus is, it is also to say that that is what Caesar is not. Caesar laid claim to the title Son of a God. To call Jesus the Son of the God in the city of Jerusalem on the brink of Passover in that day and age was to make a political statement that the powers and principalities of the world could not mistake. Which brings me to my second comment, which is what happened next. This is a story about moving. So where did Jesus go after he processed into Jerusalem? Two places. First, to the temple, where he made things worse. And then, to the home of friends, to rest and to prepare. Let's hear the story as Matthew tells it. Again, at chapter 21, this time, verses 12 through 17. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? He left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. By mocking the triumphal procession, Jesus has offended the Roman Empire and the person of Caesar. By overturning the exchange system that supported the temple sacrifices, and challenging the Jewish authorities by performing miraculous healings in the courtyard of Judaism's most holy precinct, Jesus has offended the religious hierarchy of his own people. As if it wasn't enough to have Rome set against him, he now has Jerusalem set against him as well. And so the stage is now set. The powers and authorities of the world on one side, and only Jesus on the other. The line I love best in that scripture is the last one. He left them and went out of the city of Bethany and spent the night there. Bethany, of course, is the nearby village where Martha and Mary and Lazarus live. In the midst of a deadly uproar that he has called upon himself, Jesus withdraws to the home of his friends, not to avoid what is coming, but to hold fast those things which are most precious in dark times, the love and presence of those close to our hearts. And so the stage is set for our journey through Holy Week. On this Palm Sunday, I am praying for you and yours, and I bid your prayers for me and mine and for all of God's children who walk this shadowed path that we find ourselves upon. I'll leave you with this prayer, which begins the liturgy of Palm Sunday, and thus begins the work of this most sacred week. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, team, that was your never daunted spiritual fitness moment, and I'm Chaplain Newland, your Koa Shepherd. Until my next transmission, keep the faith, practice what you preach, and care for those around you. Signing off.